early 1950s, Cunard's Queen Mary and Queen Elizabeth dominated the North Atlantic, rivaled only by the SS United States after her maiden voyage in 1952. The French line relied on the SS Ile de France and the SS Liberté for their transatlantic service. The two ships were popular and known for their unique style and luxury, but both were rapidly aging. The Ile de France was launched in 1926 and Liberté, formerly the Europa, was launched in 1928 in Germany and handed over to the French as a war reparation. It was clear to the French that if they wanted to stay competitive in the North Atlantic, their aging ships would need to be replaced. France never really got over losing the Normandy in World War II. To this day, many feel that she was the greatest ocean liner to ever sail the Atlantic, and had the Americans not accidentally destroyed her, she would still probably be competing with the Cunard Queens well into the 1960s. Furthermore, the French were embroiled in a war to maintain their rule over Algeria. It was felt that a new superliner would be an ideal way to update the French line's aging fleet and boost national pride. Initial plans called for two complimentary 35,000-ton ships, but Charles de Gaulle, the future president of France, called for one large liner that would command the same level of pride as the Normandy. The plans, which would have to be publicly funded, were controversial, and debates over the project lasted three and a half years. Construction was officially commissioned by the chairman of the French line, Jean-Marie, on the 25th of July, 1956, but debates over the scale and design of the new ship would continue for another year. Although it was becoming clear that ocean travel was on the decline, the French set out to build a liner that would command attention. She would be fast, large, and luxurious, but there were limitations to what they could achieve. The SS United States, built in collaboration with the United States Navy, held a speed record that was far out of reach and prohibitively expensive to attempt. But it was possible to challenge the speeds of Cunard's Queens. And while the overall size needed to surpass the Queen Elizabeth was also unrealistic, it was feasible to build a slightly longer ship, so the SS France wouldn't be the largest or the fastest, but she would be among the best. It's unclear whether her designers had cruising in mind when they were planning the ship. She was clearly designed primarily for the North Atlantic, but there are elements that suggest conversions between a liner and a cruise ship were on their minds. For instance, the ship was designed with only two classes, which made it easier to convert the ship to a one-class cruising mode than older, more traditional ocean liners. Her keel was laid down on September 7, 1957, as hull G19 at the Chantier de l'Antarctique Shipyard in Saint-Nazaire, France. Rather than the traditional method of constructing a skeleton and attaching steel hull plating, the SS France was constructed using the modern method of prefabrication in which large sections of the ship were built separately and then welded together. Together. This method of shipbuilding is still used today. As originally built, the ship cost 80 million US dollars and would come in at 66,343 gross registered tons, 1,035.6 feet in length, a beam of 110.6 feet, 12 decks, and 160,000 horsepower. She was propelled by geared CEM Parsons turbines that powered four propellers. Her cruising speed was 31 knots, making her the second fastest liner in service, second only to the SS United States. She had accommodations for up to 617 first-class passengers, 1,637 tourist-class passengers, and 1,253 crew. The SS France was launched on May 11, 1960. She was christened by Yvonne de Gaulle, the wife of President Charles de Gaulle, who was also in attendance. In his speech, he announced that France had been given a new Normandy. She began her sea trials on November 19, 1961, and averaged an impressive and unexpected 35.21 knots. Her maiden voyage left Le Havre on February 3, 1962. She arrived in New York to fanfare and water sleuths, one of the last ships to receive such a welcome. While the France was built to carry on the legacy of the Normandy, her interiors never quite lived up to the infamously glamorous spaces found on the great ship. One limiting factor was cost, but the biggest limitation was the fate that brought down the Normandy in the first place. Fire. Safety regulations greatly limited the amount of wood that could be used in the ship's interior spaces. Furthermore, the giant sweeping spaces that made Normandy so grand were also the very design factors that allowed fire to spread so rapidly. The SS France, like the SS United States, was designed with all these precautions in mind. Some critics took issue with what they called her sterile decor, but the ship was tasteful, and more importantly, she was much safer. She was especially noted for her sweeping decks and her kitchens, which were well equipped to live up to the expectations passengers had for the world-class French cuisine that would set the liner apart from her competitors. 
I'm convinced that part of the appeal of the French line was the abundance of free, quality table wine. Hell yeah. Her exterior designs, however, were a clear homage to the Normandy, especially the whale back on her bow. The most iconic aspect of her design was her unique winged funnels. Their modern shape was not only eye-catching but functional, designed to direct exhaust fumes away from her passenger decks. The SS France was immediately popular and attracted celebrities and other notable passengers. Her only real flaw was her timing. Throughout the 1960s, the once lucrative transatlantic route was quickly becoming limited to people who were afraid to fly or just weren't in much of a hurry to get to their destination. Only a few years into the France's career, the French line began dividing her time between transatlantic crossings in the summer and cruises to tropical destinations in the winter. Her versatile design proved useful for her dual purpose, but she was in some ways limited as a cruise ship by the very things that made her so perfect for crossing the North Atlantic. Many of her upper decks were enclosed by large windows which created hot, stagnant spaces in tropical climates, and her pools were both enclosed. Despite these limitations, the France was proving herself a capable and popular cruise ship but the 1970s would prove incredibly challenging for the SS France. By 1970, only four out of every 100 passengers crossed the Atlantic by sea. Though demand on the Atlantic was all but gone, the French line saw opportunity in the growing cruise market, but the cruising industry was dominated by smaller ships that could access more ports and operate more cheaply. The France was anything but cheap. In 1973, the oil crisis made the situation considerably worse when oil skyrocketed from $3 to $12 a barrel. With operating costs ballooning, the French line turned to the French government to request an increase in the ship's subsidy by $10 million a year to keep the symbol of national pride in service. But to their dismay, the French government had other plans in mind. The French government not only rejected the French line's request for additional funding, they chose to eliminate the line's subsidy altogether to free up funds to devote to a modern new symbol of French national pride, the Concorde. The decision was a death sentence for the SS France, which could not be operated without subsidies. It was announced in 1974 that the Great Liner would be withdrawn from service on October 25th of that year. In a last-ditch effort to save their jobs, the crew decided to strike. On an eastbound crossing in September of 1974, the crew commandeered the ship outside of Le Havre. They anchored the giant ship at the entrance of the port, blocking traffic from entering and leaving, and demanded that the ship be returned to service and that they be given a 35% wage increase. That voyage would end up being the last the ship would sail under the French line. Over a month into the standoff, the strike ended in failure on December 7, 1947. Under the French line, the SS France sailed 377 crossings and 93 cruises. She carried a total of 588,024 passengers on the North Atlantic and 113,862 on cruises. She sailed a total of 1,860,000 nautical miles. But her career was far from over. The last station on your stroll at night, a club called Dazzles, the funniest discotheque that has ever been launched, as expressed by the ship owner. Any comment is hardly necessary. It wouldn't be understandable anyway. The shuttering of the French line left the SS France future in question. She sat untouched for four years with all of her fittings completely intact. In 1979, New Kloster, a Norwegian shipping magnate and founder of the Norwegian Caribbean Line, was eager to grow his four-ship fleet of Caribbean cruise ships. The company was proving wildly successful, and Kloster was eager to add a larger ship to his fleet. Not wanting to wait to build his own, he turned his attention to the growing number of retired ocean liners. The Italian Michelangelo and Raffaello were considered, as well as the SS United States. But upon touring the France, which was lovingly maintained and in pristine condition, Kloster fell in love, saying, She looked down and smiled at me. I knew then that I wanted to keep her smiling for the next 20 years. At the time, the France was an odd choice. It was considered by many in the industry that a purpose-built ocean liner, especially one so large, would never work as a full-time cruiser. But Kloster was a pioneer in the industry and recognized that a ship could be a destination in itself. A large and popular ship with a reputation for glamour would fit that new formula perfectly. It also didn't hurt that the ship was well within her prime and had already established herself as a popular cruise ship. 
Closter purchased the liner for $18 million and in August of 1979 she was renamed the SS Norway in a simple ceremony. Many in France hated the transaction for the loss of French jobs and the sight of a national symbol being turned over to a foreign country. But the deal was done and the ship was towed to Bremerhaven, Germany where she would undergo the largest conversion in maritime history. The Norway would become the largest cruise ship in the world and would remain so for a large portion of her career. Klosser had money to spend and $80 million was invested into the 8th month conversion process. The ship's public spaces and accommodations were completely overhauled. Many of the features of modern cruise ships were introduced on the reconfigured Norway. Sprawling Lido decks were added to her stern with two new pools and an outdoor restaurant. Her promenades were converted to boulevard-style main streets lined with shops, restaurants, and lounges. Her theater was overhauled, and a famously popular disco nightclub, Dazzles, was also added. The company also planned to replace the liner's iconic funnels with something more modern, but after public outcry they decided to keep the original design. This was obviously a good choice because those weird-ass funnels are everything. To compensate for the massive liner's inability to access smaller ports, two 400-seat tenders, the Norway 1 and Norway 2, were added to the bow. But the biggest changes made by Kloster that directly influenced the Norway success were driven by economics. Two of her four propellers were removed, and her forward two engine rooms were decommissioned, reducing her fuel consumption by two-thirds. This reduced the ship's speed to 25 knots, a speed more than adequate for a cruise ship. Finally, bow and stern thrusters were added, which removed the need for expensive tugboats to guide her into port. The conversions increased the ship's size to 70,202 gross registered tons. The Norway was rechristened on April 14, 1980 an odd date to christen a ship, and her first cruise from New York to Miami took place in May of that year. She was an immediate success with passengers who were drawn in by her size and reputation, but the real differentiator was the host of new amenities offered on the Norway that were completely unheard of on other cruise ships at the time. Her success sparked a building frenzy in the cruise industry with companies competing to build the largest ships with the newest amenities. This trend continues to this day with ships like Royal Caribbean Symphony of the Seas, a ship more than three times the size of the Norway. For nearly two decades, the Norway was one of the most popular ships to cruise the Caribbean. She was modified several times to stay competitive and comply with changing safety regulations. Her largest refit took place in September and October of 1990 when two new decks of suites and luxury cabins were added. The additions increased the ship's size to 76,049 tons and made her significantly uglier. NCL was adding new ships to their fleet and the aging Norway, once the pride of the company, was starting to become a burden. Cuts were made to her maintenance and upkeep as her popularity waned and she began to be plagued by a series of mechanical breakdowns, fires, and several legal issues related to illegal waste dumping. Cool. Problems for the ship were mounting and she was slated for retirement when she departed New York Harbor for the last time on September 5th, 2001. During the voyage to Greenock, Scotland, her passengers learned of the attacks of September 11th on the city they had departed six days earlier. The terrorist attacks had a major impact on the cruise industry, but it was decided that the Norway would return to service after a minor cosmetic refit. However, her deteriorating mechanical issues were never fully addressed. At 6.37 a.m. on May 25, 2003, while docked in Miami, a large explosion rocked the Norway. Superheated steam tore through her boiler room and blasted into the crew quarters above. The blast killed eight crew members and injured another 17. No passengers were hurt as the blast was contained to crew spaces. Upon investigation, the National Transportation Safety Board determined the probable cause of the boiler rupture on the Norway was the deficient boiler operation, maintenance, and inspection practices. The ship was towed back to Bremerhaven on September 23, 2003. Although NCL initially announced that the ship would be repaired, they hesitated to undertake the costly work it would take to bring the damaged ship back to a working condition. The ship was used to accommodate NCL crew training to work on the company's newest ship, Pride of America. Finally, on March 23, 2004, NCL's chief executive, Colin Veitch, announced that the Norway would never sail again, and ownership would be transferred to NCL's parent company, Star Cruises. The ship's retirement sparked a lengthy battle over what would be done with the massive ship. Unfortunately, the ship was absolutely loaded with everyone's favorite fibrous silicate, asbestos. The German government blocked the ship from being sold until a plan was put forth to safely dismantle her asbestos-ridden body, but after some dubious legal maneuvers, she was renamed the Blue Lady and sold for scrapping in 2006. She was towed to India and finally scrapped in 2008.
There are a lot of differences between ocean liners and cruise ships, but one that's often overlooked is the spirit invested into a vessel. Ocean liners were purpose-built symbols of national pride, while cruise ships are purely commercial endeavors that seldom represent more than a good vacation. The SS France and the Queen Elizabeth II were two of the last great ocean liners built to represent their nations. But when the SS France was transformed into the SS Norway, something of that ocean liner spirit carried through for a moment until it was lost. While she was wildly popular for many years, she became expendable. While the Kiwi II remained in Cunard's meticulous care, Norway was neglected to the point of disaster. The SS France symbolizes the transition from liners to cruising. She was beloved during both periods of her life and managed to pull off both roles incredibly well. Against all odds, she was a deeply popular cruise ship that managed to shape the industry we all know today. I can't help but wonder if some of that success came from the hopes and aspirations that went into her original construction when her builders probably knew that they were constructing one of the last great liners to ever sail the Atlantic.